Well, as always, what a blessing it is to be with you today, especially in this Advent season. I pray they're able to spend plenty of time in the next few days amidst all the rush and busyness of this season, that you'll spend time reflecting on Christ, on His Advent, on His birth. Christ was, of course, born to die, to provide salvation for us, and uh, provide us then the assurance of salvation, which is the subject of 1 John, which we've been studying all year long. If you've been with us, you know that uh, we have been studying this book, this letter that John wrote his church, uh, possibly even a series of sermons he preached in his church, and delivered them to them, delivered it to them in writing. And uh, from the beginning, this thing has all been pointed to this idea of assurance. We took our time, to be honest, at the beginning, I took my time going through this very slowly, and we've been moving rather rapidly as far as our pace normally goes here. The last few weeks, we sort of had our pedal to the metal, so to speak. And today, we're going to finish our study of this magnificent letter. So your Bibles are open to 1 John chapter 5. That's our subject today. The idea of assurance and what assurance brings to us. I've entitled today's message, Blessed Assurance, after that old hymn, Blessed Assurance. John has been writing about this subject, really it's the subject matter for his whole book, to provide for us the means by which we as Christians can find assurance. And he's going to close the book by saying, now let me show you what assurance does, what it provides for us in the life of the believer. You'll remember some of the purposes of John's little letter here. All of them tie to the idea of assurance. John, we saw at the beginning, gave us five ideas of assurance. He gave us the idea of joy for our assurance, so that your joy may be full, he says there in chapter 1. He wanted us to focus on holiness in chapter 2. He says, my little child, children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. Of course, this idea of Morality and living a life bearing the fruit gives us assurance. Later on in 2, we learn that he wrote them for their theological safety. They should believe the right things to be assured of their salvation. He says later on in chapter 2 that he is writing these things so that people would not deceive them. A little threat to his congregation there. He writes them to love one another, for this is the message that you heard from us in the beginning, that we should love one another. Chapter 3, verse 11. And of course, we know that loving one another is another sign that should give us Assurance. But this final purpose, really, this idea of assurance, the thing that ties everything together, it's the ultimate reason that John wrote this letter, to give us assurance. He ties love to it, he ties theology to it, holiness to it, joy to it. And so it should be no surprise to us that he ends right here with the subject of assurance, assurance of salvation. Assurance of your relationship with God, of your standing with God, assurance of your eternity. Like I said, what he does in these final verses is not only to articulate that assurance, but then to show us the blessings of assurance. What blessings, what are the resultant blessings, knowing that you are indeed a child of God? My prayer today is that if you're a genuine believer, you'll find the joy of this blessed assurance. And my hope is that if you're not a believer, you'll be drawn by these words here in 1 John, drawn to salvation, to repent. Have faith and find this sweet, blessed assurance. Let's read our text this morning, and then we'll finish our study in this magnificent book. Our text is beginning in verse 13. It goes down to verse 20, the very end of the chapter, 1 John chapter 5. <clears throat> Follow along as I read aloud. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us in whatever we ask. We know that we have the request that we have asked in him. If anyone sees his brother committing sin, not leading to death, he shall ask. God will give him life. Those who commit sins, they do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on committing sin. But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true. We are in him who is true, in his 
His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Pray that God blesses the reading of His Word. Now let's just remind ourselves in the next few minutes of this blessing, this blessing of assurance. As a Christian, God gives us assurance, knowing to a high degree of certainty. I don't think humans are capable of 100% certainty because we're not capable of 100% knowledge. But to the highest ability that we have, God gives us certainty. He gives us assurance about our destiny. God provides this assurance about our eternity, our, the way of true salvation, and whether or not you are truly saved. In fact, I think that your salvation is the one thing in life that you can have the most certainty about. And I think God wants us to find our greatest level of certainty about this one thing, that we are indeed born again. That we can have what the Bible calls full assurance. God provides this kind of assurance to us, the ultimate highest level of human certainty. You can be assured about many things. The thing that you ought to be assured about the most, according to John's mentality, is your salvation. Now, years ago, people didn't have a problem with Christians and other people of different religious persuasions having assurance, having certainty. People would live their lives, they would have certainty about what they believe, and whether they were agnostic or atheistic or believed in Buddha or whatever, and they would debate and they would have great certainty about these things and be openly uh, confessing these things and have debate and have assurance about what they believe. But nowadays, I think there's something that, that is sort of crept into the mentality. I think maybe it's postmodernism or maybe it's just the, the common mentality. And that is to say this, that if anybody is certain about something, they must be prideful. Do you hear this a lot? I think especially about Christians. Christians are certain about their salvation and they're certain about the way to God, if they're certain about the gospel, about Jesus Christ and who he is, people look at us and they say, you are so prideful to think that you can know any of that stuff. Strangely enough, they don't really look to false religions and say the same thing. They don't look to those who worship in the name of Muhammad or Islam. They don't seem to say that very much. But they look to Christians and they say, you're so certain about what you believe. How can you be so certain? That is pride to have certainty. But this is an illogical connection. There's not a connection, a logical connection, or maybe a correlation, but there's not a logical connection between certainty and pride. You can be certain about things and not be prideful, right? I mean, a lot of us, we fly from this island a lot of times, we get on these big planes, and we want our pilot to be certain how to fly the plane, right? We don't want him to be humble and say, well, you know, I just don't know what's going on. I know a lot of buttons are very confusing, and I'm just sort of open to pushing any button at any time. No, we don't want that. We want him to be certain how to fly that plane. We want him to know the way. And we want him to push the right buttons at the right time. And we want him to be certain about how to land that plane. We don't connect certainty with pride there. He's certain about things, but that is not necessarily prideful. And we would say this about all kinds of other things. Industries. We would say this about carpenters and concrete workers and nurses and computer technicians. People can be certain about things and not be prideful. It does not follow that if someone is certain about something that they are necessarily prideful. So we Christians have to sort of ignore all this banter. That if we're certain about salvation, that if we're certain about the gospel, that if we're certain about Jesus Christ, then we must be prideful. No, that is not true. We can be certain about things and not have any pride. In fact, John has showed us through this whole book that a greater level of certainty, a greater level of assurance and knowledge and understanding of the gospel actually leads to a level of humility, a level of brokenness, a level of willingness to understand and learn the truth. John's not afraid of certainty. He clearly believes that we can find certainty and salvation. He clearly believes that we can find assurance. So all throughout this letter... He's giving us these words. He's giving us this confidence as we study the word, as we look at our lives. He's, he's providing us the means that we can find a great deal of certainty when it comes to our salvation. In fact, I did a brief word study. Not only right here in this passage, he say over and over, we know, we know, we know. There's a level of certainty right here. If you look throughout the rest of the book, 13 times directly in this form in relation to salvation, does John say that we have direct concrete knowledge about our salvation, but almost 40 times does he mention this idea that we know we can have certainty about these things. 
John is not afraid of certainty. John is not afraid of assurance. And even that assurance, though it does not have a hint of pride, it can be great, it can be certain. It's all about the truth and grace of God. Now we saw this throughout our study here of this book. We take these tests, these tests of salvation, and those things are given to us as the means through which we can find assurance. We don't find assurance through a priest or a pastor or a parent or walking an aisle or getting our name on a card or someone coming up and saying, bless you, or you are a Christian. I just, if there's anyone I know that's a Christian, remember a guy came to me and said, I know I'm a Christian. I said, why? Do you understand the gospel? He said, no, I know nothing about the gospel. But my mom told me I'm a Christian, so I must be a Christian. We don't find assurance that way. John has been preaching to us and teaching us that we find assurance by passing these particular tests of salvation. The three tests we saw, the doctrinal test of salvation, that is believing the right things. If you believe in the Christ as he's presented in Scripture, you can find certainty of your salvation. If you reject the Christ that the Bible presents to us, you make God out to be a liar. We saw that. You make him out to be a liar. You are not indeed a child of God. On the other hand, like I said, if you profess Christ, the Christ presented to us in Scripture, you can find a level of assurance. Another way you find assurance is looking at your life. This is the moral test of assurance. John says that if you truly love God, if you truly love Christ, just as Christ said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will obey. There will be the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life. There will be a change in your behavior, a constant, consistent moving closer and closer to Christ. There will be a, a maturing process in your life. When you look at your life and you see that maturing process, you see that slow, maybe measured, sometimes slower, sometimes faster, faster change in your life. You look at that and you see that, then you can find a level of assurance. That's the moral or a moral or ethical test of salvation. The final test, the final thing that will give you assurance, the final question you ask yourself is, do I love the people of God? This is the relational or social test of salvation. If you love the people of God, if you love the bride of Christ, these are the people whom Christ gave his life for. Do you love him? Do you love them like Christ loves them? If you do, then you can have the assurance that you are indeed a genuine believer. So John has been saying, if you pass these tests, then you can be certain of your salvation. You can find genuine assurance. John is writing to them about their assurance. And so he says, he concludes, really, this is sort of the, the final conclusive verse of it all. Verse 13, such a wonderful truth. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you know that you have better odds. Not that you know that you have a better chance of going to heaven and you're just sort of increasing the odds by being part of the church. No, you may know that you have eternal life. What a wonderful truth that you can have certainty about your salvation. This is the thing that plagued me before I was saved. I was in church. I was around church. I did a lot of church stuff. But I had no certainty. I had no assurance of my salvation. And God revealed to me through that lack of assurance that I was not a repentant person. I did not pass the moral test. And so God was not providing that assurance in my heart that Christians should have. And through that lack of assurance, God drew me to himself and saved me. Perhaps that's happened to you. I know that even in our church, in this last year, we've had several people come to that knowledge. What a blessed truth it is, this truth of assurance. So, now, at the end of this beautiful letter, John concludes with this idea of assurance, and now he wants to show us the blessings of that assurance. Just briefly, and sort of as the punctuation, he wants to show us the wonderful blessings of being certain of your salvation. The, the wonderful blessings of being assured. So what does assurance provide for us? I wrote down three things. Perhaps you'll want to write these down as well. Number one, assurance gives confidence of answered prayer. Assurance gives confidence of answered prayer. Look at verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Just stop right there. Flowing from this idea of assurance. 
flowing from your certainty of salvation is this confidence that you can ask things of God. You can go to Him in prayer. That you have standing before God to ask Him things. You know, we live, I think we miss a little bit of the, the magnificent beauty of this because we live in a day of democracy and rights and privileges. We have a right. It's my right as an American citizen. It's my privilege. And we live in this democracy where, where even the littlest person has a voice, right? We treasure this. We appreciate this. But most of history was dominated by kings and queens, right? Monarchs. I don't know rights and privileges for the most part. Even when they tried things, such as the Roman Empire and the Senate, it wasn't very long before it was corrupted and eventually had an emperor who was deemed sort of part divine, part deity. People were to worship him. So most of history, for most of time, even if you go back 300 years in Hawaiian history or British history, if you go back in time, you find out that people had to do what the monarch said. And there was no hearing. You could not waltz into the palace. You couldn't waltz to the place of governance and make demands. You, you couldn't ask them anything. You would hope that maybe they would govern and be judicious in a way that would bless you. But that's all you really had was some kind of remote hope that maybe they might judge in a way that would bless you. So perhaps for those who read John's word the first time, this was an amazing truth for them to uncover that, that they had standing, not just before a king on earth, but before the God of the universe. That they could go with confidence and stand at His throne. In fact, that word, confidence there, it's the same word in Hebrews that says we boldly approach the throne. Same word. And it doesn't mean boldly like I have these rights and you better listen to me or else. It's boldly in the terms of you can come and make a request. You can come and ask for things. You can come and ask for blessings. You can come and ask and make a request before the God of heaven. It's the freedom to talk and make requests. So into verse 14 and 15, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. What's John saying? A spoken and heard request is an answered request. You ask it, and God will fulfill, fulfill it. God listens, and God fulfills. God listens and gives us whatever we ask. Now, before you get too excited about how rich you're going to get in this system that you're now discovering, did you notice the condition, condition that God gives, that John gives here at the end here? He says, if we ask anything, what? According to his will. If we ask anything... According to his will. Now at this point people get a little confused. People are very confused about how to find or how to know the will of God. And there's books, many books written on how to find the will of God. And uh, people ask the question, how am I going to find out if God wants me to take this job or stay in the military, get out of the military, or marry this girl or marry that guy, and what I should do and what decisions I should make. And there's nothing, I've been reading the Bible, there's nothing in here that tells me what car to buy. How am I supposed to know the will of God? And some people answer that by saying, well, you have to have a mystical, epiphanous experience. You've got to have some kind of burning bush experience where God reveals himself to you the specifics about how you're supposed to live your life and what decisions you're supposed to make. Once you learn that, once you have that mystical experience, that burning bush experience, once you have that epiphany, then you should you know what you should do and what you should pray for. Then you know about these things. The problem with that thinking is the Bible clearly teaches us that we cannot know the sovereign secret will of God. We don't know God's mind. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We cannot know this. I understand that to those to whom God had designated to write the Bible, to reveal what would happen in Scripture, God gave epiphanies and miraculous specific revelation about their lives in the future. But God does not give that to us. In fact, Jesus said, you guys, all you guys want to do, and he's talking to the Jews that were coming out to him, all you guys want, you want this epiphany, you want miracles and signs. But I tell you this, I'm going to stop giving this to you. I've given you all the signs. You read about it, read about it in the Word. And all those signs are not enough for you. I simply give you the Word. 
So what we discover in Scripture, the way we know the will of God, is simply to know the Word of God. No, there's not a chapter and verse that tells me what car to buy. But I learn the principles from the Word of God, and I apply them to my life. If I know the Word of God, I know the will of God. If I understand the Word of God, I understand the will of God. If I pray the Word of God, I pray the will of God. So you say, well, what about the specifics? We do our best, right? We know the generalities. We know what God's will is in terms of generalities, what he wants to do in our lives. Then we just make the best decision we can based upon the principles here. How do I know this? Well, the Bible very clearly says this about itself. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says that the Bible is given, it's inspired, it's good for reproving, rebuke, it's exhortation, that the man of God may be equipped, adequate for every good work. Not just a few, not just some, every good work. You study the word, you apply its principles to his life, to your life, and you do your best. That's how you know and obey the will of God. So when it's talking about praying the will of God, you're praying things that are given to us in Scripture. For instance, you pray things about sanctification. This is the process of God maturing a believer. Let's say you have a friend or perhaps a loved one, a spouse or a child who is a Christian and they're immature to some extent. You start praying that they mature and that they put away sin and that they grow. Guess what? God will answer that prayer in the affirmative. He'll do it. Every time. And if he doesn't do it completely about that issue right there, one day he will fully answer that prayer incomplete. Let me give you some verses about the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 5 says that this is God's will, that you should be sanctified. That you should avoid sexual immorality, he says. Romans 12, 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Good and pleasing and perfect will. So as you grow, as you are conformed, you are proving God's perfect will. You're demonstrating that God's will is being done in your life. Probably the best place to go in terms of prayer for sanctification is the prayer of Christ for his followers, initially his disciples, but then it expands to us, right? John 17, high priestly prayer. What does Jesus pray there? I have given them your word. The world has hated them because they're not of this world. It's just as I'm not of this world. I do not ask that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world just as I'm not of this world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so have I sent them to the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in the truth. So Jesus' will for us, God's will for us, is that we be matured and growing and sanctified in the word that he has given us. So when you begin to pray that for other believers, the answer is always yes. Because we know for certain this is the will of God, that Christians be sanctified. Now again, we're imperfect, we're human. Someone may be sinning against you and hurting you and harming you, and you're praying that they would repent and change. But their repentance is incomplete. Until they are glorified, that is going to be incomplete. So sometimes it's not as much as we want. But we do know that God is, if they're a true believer, God is working in them. Earlier in John chapter 6, Jesus says this, All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up in the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should, not, should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So this is his will, that we would be sanctified and we would continue in this growth all the way to the last day, all the way to the end. God would preserve us and keep us and grow us and mature us all the way to the last day. This is what Paul says to the Philippians. He who began a good work in you will complete it into the day of Christ Jesus. God has started to work in you. He will continue to do that work. God has started to work in someone who is sinning, even if they're a believer. If they're sinning, God is working in them, and he's sanctifying them. Maybe it's slower than we would really like, but if you're praying, Lord, sanctify them, God is answering that prayer in the affirmative. So here in John 
1 John chapter 5, this is precisely the example that John gives about asking something according to the will of God. The example John gives here is asking that our brother or sister be sanctified and turn away from sin. That's the example that John gives here. Verse 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. This is a prayer not for yourself, not for your own growth or holiness, though we do want to pray for that. This is an example prayer that God answers because it's according to his will. God wills that the other children of God grow and mature. And God is determined to make that happen. So when you see your brother or sister in sin, you pray for him or her that they would grow, that they would repent. God is doing a work in their hearts. Again, it's not always perfect. It's not complete until glorification. But God is working in their lives. The exception that John gives here is if they're not a believer. That's what I take it to mean. The exception clause about the sin unto death. The sin unto death is rejecting Christ. The sin unto death is turning away from Christ. John's not saying you shouldn't pray for unbelievers if they be saved. What he's saying is if you're praying for a believer to, to turn from their sin, you don't know if they're going to repent and be saved or not. You can pray for them, but the answer, we don't know the answer. The only answer we know we can be certain about is if they are a child of God and you're praying for them to be sanctified, you can be certain that God answered that. You know that's a part of God's will. We don't know who all are going to be saved. We evangelize everyone. We pray for everyone. But the answered prayer is applied to those that we know that God is doing a work in. That all these, these will passages about what God will do in all these Christians' lives, we have assurance that God will answer those things in the affirmative. So, that's verse 18. We know that everyone who's been born of God does not keep on sinning. So you know God's will in their life. You know that they, God doesn't want them and God's working in them to get away from their sin. But he who is born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We, in other, in other words, we protect one another by praying for one another. Another reason to be a part of the church and, and be honest and open and authentic about your sins and failures so that others can pray for you and God can answer in the affirmative and say, yes, I want to do that work. Yes, your prayers are answered. We want to be praying for one another so that God will be answering those prayers and we will be sanctified. Now, we went through this in detail, this work in the person's life, their moral life, turning away from sin, this idea that everyone being born of God doesn't stay in sin. They don't have a habit of sinning. We studied that in detail a few months ago. Christians, true Christians, are always turning from sin, so God's prayer, your prayer to God, is always the answer. So, Read this, and the example that John gives of a prayer answer. It's a prayer for your saved brother or sister who's in sin. You're praying that they know God better. You're praying that they mature and grow. You're praying for their sanctification. You're praying for their holiness. You're praying for perseverance and preservation. You're praying for fruit of the Spirit. You're praying for those things and those answers. Those will always be given in the positive. It doesn't mean you don't pray for the other stuff. Healing better circumstances in terms of finances. You can pray for that stuff, though you don't know the will of God. But the promise goes with those things that are definitely the will of God. Sometimes God uses those difficulties to accomplish the good stuff, the sanctification. Everybody familiar with Johnny Erickson Tata? Johnny Erickson, only Johnny Erickson, she was a young teenager, college girl, in the late 60s, early 70s, and she dove into the ocean right onto her head on a rock shallow. And she was paralyzed from her neck down. She's a quadriplegic from the neck down. And for the first few years, I think, a few months or a few years of her uh, uh, disabling condition, she was convinced that there's no way that God wants her, a good little Christian girl, to be in a wheelchair. That God want her healed. So she went around. She made a tour. She went around and found all these healers, these people that say have these healing services. And she found out real quickly if there's a place that they put you if you actually have a true need, a real true healing. They shove you in the back and they hide you away from all the, the chaos that's happening at the front. 
And they kept on just hiding her away and pushing her away and keeping her from coming up the front. And she thought, you know, God, now I just want to be healed. That's all I want. Surely you want me to be a good evangelist. I want to be a missionary. I want to do all these things. Surely you want me healed. And she kept on trying to seek healing. And then suddenly she realized one day, she realized that God wants of her more than anything else, spiritual healing. He wants humility. He wants sanctification. He wants her to get rid of sin in her life. And so she set her mind not on the things that she didn't know God's will about, whether or not she's going to be healed. She set her mind on the will of God, sanctification. She focused on that. And now today, many of you nodded your head moments ago, because Johnny Erickson Tata has ministered to you. Her message of focusing on what God's will, as it is revealed in Scripture, your growth, your personal sanctification, is a greater work than being rich or healed or whatever. And you've been praying that prayer now for years, just like Johnny Erickson taught it as, as well. Well, when we pray those prayers, those prayers that are clearly revealed to us as the will of God, God always answers those things, yes and amen. God responds to those things because they're according to His will. But what great assurance we have. We have this wonderful assurance, this certainty that we're a believer, and we enter the throne room of God, now understanding His will by His word. And we, we ask those things. And God always says, yes. Isn't that blessed assurance? Isn't that a wonderful position that we have as genuine believers? Well, the last two assurances we have, the last two things that assurance provides for us are pretty simple, so it won't take very long to go through them. Number two, assurance gives confidence of eternal home. Assurance gives confidence of eternal home. Verse 19 we know that we are another we know, right? We know that we are from God. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. John is contrasting who we are with, where we are with, in terms of heaven and hell, eternity, with the world and the evil one. There's this contrast. I think John writes this for a very simple reason, is that we get tired of this old world, right? We get world weary, don't we? We get tired of the way people treat one another. We get weary of tough stuff in life, disaster, disease, complex psychological and emotional problems. We get weary of that. We get weary of the simple things. I live far down, far down the Leeward Coast, and I get weary of the traffic. All the time. I get weary of the way people drive. I get weary of the people who don't follow the rules and they wear all black and run across the street in the middle of the night. We get weary of this stuff. You get tired when you go to the supermarket and you hear people just in the process of buying groceries cussing and using the F word, pro F -word profusely. You get tired of that. You get weary of that. Some of you would say, I get weary of my coworkers. I'm, I'm in a job now, and it's a bunch of lost people who have no interest in God, and I'm tired of it. Some of you get weary in your marriage. You get tired of the sin and the problems and the things that invade your marriage. You get tired of all this. Well, a good assurance to have is to know that this is not the end. That this old nasty, sin-filled world full of evil is dominated by the evil one who will be put to death forever. We, we have that assurance that we have a home beyond what's right in front of us. We have that assurance. Some of you are like me. You moved around a little bit as a kid. I, I consider Oklahoma my home, uh, though I lived in many different places. Uh, but about half my life, it's Oklahoma. And so I root for the Sooners and for now for the Thunder. And even though I've never lived there when I've had the Thunder, but I, I root for the, the home teams. But there's a part of me that realizes even when I go back to Oklahoma, this is not really home. Things have changed. People have changed. People have moved in and out. Streets have changed. Names have changed. Things are different. And I found this to be true even for those of you who've lived in one place your whole life. Things change. Your neighbors change. People change. Language changes. Culture changes. And you can get world weary. You can get so tired of all the change that you almost feel like, I have no home. I don't really have a place that I say, well, that's home for me. Whether you're from Oklahoma City or from Manila or whether you're from Seoul, Korea, 
You look over this world and you say, maybe the same thing as I do, I really don't have a home here. My home is beyond the grave. I have an eternal home. This world right now is dominated by the evil one and the evil people that follow him. That's what this world is all about. My home is beyond the grave. Well, that's what John is giving us. He's giving us this encouragement. Look beyond the grave. Look beyond what's the present. All this world weariness. Look beyond and see this with assurance of where you are headed. You can get tired. You can get angry at drivers, at politicians, at the news, at just the world. And John is giving us this assurance, this uh, uh, confidence that we have, we have a home beyond the grave. I don't remember who it was, but one of the Puritans said this, what a fool we would consider someone who on his way to inherit millions broke his carriage and then wept and wrung his hands all the way to his, his inheritance crying, my carriage is broken, my carriage is broken. Do you get the point? We are on our way to an inheritance that is beyond belief. How can we com complain about anything? We know that this is all coming to an end. This is not our home. Our inheritance is beyond the grave and it is an eternity of beauty what a beautiful assurance. What a beautiful certainty that we have that we are saved. We have that glory beyond this existence. So that's assurance number two. Assurance number three. Assurance gives us confidence of spiritual growth. Now it's pointing us sort of away from the friend who sins. It's pointing to us. Assurance that you indeed will grow. Verse 20. And we know. He's talking about us. And we, you and I, us, we know. That the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him as true is true. And we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, He is the true God and eternal life. You ever want a passage that just tells you Jesus is God? There it is, okay? There's plenty of passages that allude to it, plenty of passages that say it. But this is one that just says it very plainly. Jesus Christ, He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So John says essentially two things in these two verses. The first point is about our knowledge. We have this. We have the Son of God. We have this understanding. God has given us this knowledge. We know Him who is true. We're in Him who is true. God has provided this for us. God has given us the doctrine, the truth of who we are and who we are in and who Christ is. God has given that to you. He has imparted it to you, not just in your mind or your emotions. He's given it to your very heart. The very core of who you are is defined by Jesus Christ. And because of that, and because Christ has done that for you, he says, very applicably, applicably keep yourselves from the Antichrist. Keep yourselves from idols. The false Christ. The anti-Jesus stuff out there. I think it's just a brilliant end to John's gospel. John is never the pastor. He can't say something theologically and not give you a little bit of application. Show you how to live it out. Christ has done this for you. Now keep yourself from idols. If Christ has changed you, if Christ has redeemed you, keep yourself from idols. You see that? Beautiful application. Christ has given you understanding. He's opened your spiritual eyes. He's opened your heart. He's imparted truth to you. Truth about who you are, truth about who He is. Moreover, He's given you the assurance that you are in Him, that He is the Messiah, He is God. He promises to hold you there. You are inscribed on the palm of His hand. Now, how do you respond? By worshiping false gods? By pursuing money and pleasure and retirement and whatever else we pursue? False idols? No, we respond by keeping ourselves from idols. So that's our response. Keep yourself in mind. As you read this whole book, isn't that great that God gives us a whole book on assurance, on finding that certainty, taking those tests, letting those tests settle in us and inspire us to obey, and then finding that sweet, blessed assurance that we are genuinely born again. But what's our response to being born again? That God is in us, moving us, changing us, maturing us. And our response to that is that we keep ourselves from idols. Well, I can't do any better than John. So keep yourself 